Welcome to the Contractor Success Forum. Today we are talking about insurance tips for contractors. We are the Contractor Success Forum discussing financial strategies for running a more profitable, successful construction business. Check out our show notes at Contractor Success Forum. Well, check out our show notes on here and then go to Contractor Success Forum dot com to find out more about us your guests who are stephen brown a construction bond agent with mcdaniel whitley bonding and insurance agency for over 30 years of experience underwriting and placing bonds for you as contractors and wade carpenter with carpenter and company cpas helping contractors nationwide to become permanently profitable for over 30 years and i am rob williams your profit strategist with Iron Gate Entrepreneurial Support System, driving profit in your businesses with decades of vertical integration as a contractor, manufacturer, aviator, financial strategist in the construction industry. Woo! All right, guys. So today we are talking about insurance tips for contractors. Does it get any more exciting than this? I ever. <laughs> Wait, is this exciting? Absolutely. And a lot of my contractors don't realize that having a great insurance agent that knows construction can save them a lot of money and save them a lot of headaches if they're trying to get bonds and things like that. Yeah. Well, well Stephen, saving a lot of headaches, what you do, well, what don't you do? Do you, what, well, do you, have, you have the five worst ways? Well, I do, Rob, the five worst ways. It's the, funny the you should ask. Insurance. It's funny no, you should ask. No, you talk about insurance tips maybe hacks, anything like that. But, you know, I've read a book once called 101 Ways to Save Money on Your Business Insurance, which a majority of them really were intricate and made no sense. But as a general rule, I broke it down into the five worst ways to save money on your insurance. And then the 10 best ways to save money on your insurance. Yeah. And, and well, I'll tell you the reason I did it is because the worst ways are being uncooperative number one i hate insurance i hate talking to them i hate dealing with them i hate thinking about it i'm sorry you got to change your attitude i try to do everything i can to make insurance fun it's exciting it is fun it's a blast and we get together sit around the campfire and read insurance policies that's just good stuff i don't care who you are i don't care who you are I mean, don't we all do that? That's what fire pits were made for, you know? <laughs> Throw in the insurance policies into the fire pit. Yeah, well, look, it's a part of risk management, and a good agent handles a lot of your headaches for you. So anyway, you pretend that you don't have claims. That's the number one worst thing you can do. So that's number one. Deny it. Mm-hmm. Pretend like it never happened. You never had a claim. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. Look, claims happen. Construction is a dangerous business. Now, is that the same thing as question? Is that the same thing as me like paying for something and not turning it in? Or you're saying it, it, it you is, and I get to that in a little bit. Insurance companies verify your losses, you can't get around that. And in personal lines insurance, as soon as they pull up your driver's license number, boom, they have every wreck and accident fender bender that you even thought about having. So, there you go. Also, another thing that you see folks do to try to save money on construction insurance, this is not a good idea, is cutting back on coverage. I'm going to cut back because that's expensive. Your agent should be pushy and at least saying this is what you need, and then you can make up your mind whether you want to buy the coverage. Our job is to make sure you're covered adequately, but you don't have to buy everything we're selling. But then again, there's a reason why we're quoting you what we're quoting you. So give that some thought. The next thing, reclassify and Wade, you'll love this one. Reclassify all your employees as clerical because for workers' comp code, clerical's only like 22 cents per $100 of payroll. Those paper cuts will kill you. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey, look, throw all your job superintendents and your general laborers and anyone else you can think of in the clerical. Well, that, you know, that ain't going to work. So we'll get into what you do about that in a little bit. Here's another great bad idea. Only list the good drivers that you have MVRs on, on your driver's list. Don't list the bad ones. Because yes. out of sight, out of mind, all I can say is that those bad drivers 
I guarantee you, we'll have a wreck within a, a month of you getting an insurance policy. It always happens. You can't get away from it. So talk to your agent about that. And then there's ways to skin that cat. And then last but not least, downplay anything that you do on a regular basis that could possibly be interpreted as dangerous or deadly. You know, especially like tank painters. We've insured a number of water tank painters that... Not, are, not, not like military tanks. Just no, 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 no. And they're okay. classified as interior painting, two stories or less. But we have that sort of thing all the time. And if you have a website and you've got pictures of projects that you hope to do, or you think you could do, but you haven't done like painting tanks, please don't put them on your website. These underwriters look at your website. All right, enough of the bad things. Well, I was about to say, usually in these, Stephen, I give a personal example for everything we talk about in in every single subject, because I have one that I have done. And this one, I decided not to include these for self-protective reasons. I could have given an example of all of these five. They they could use this as evidence against you, Rob. I thought about that. So not that I'm any underwriters out there, not that I'm saying I ever did any of these, but I did not give any examples today. Just, just clarifying. Well, thank you. That's why I stayed quiet. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, look, your insurance is what it is. Okay, whatever you do for a living, if it's risky, the insurance is going to cost more. But what I have to beg you to do, listeners, is to look at that insurance as job cost, not as overhead. Allocate that insurance cost to job cost. Your agent can help you do it, which, uh, again, brings back the subject of insurance agent. That's the number one thing on the list. Pick a good I'm insurance agent. What list is this that we're saying? This is the 10, list, the, 10. the 10 best ways to save money on your insurance. Are you ready for this? Absolutely. But I just wanted to say amen to the job costing your, you know, your work. Yeah. Absolutely there. But I mean, having a great insurance agent, I, mean, I know you've talked on the podcast about having a great CPA, construction oriented CPA, but there's a huge difference between Stephen and somebody that deals in construction, bonds, those kind of things versus your general practitioner. I'm not knocking anybody, but you know, those are for personal lines. And if you're in construction, a lot of the things that Stephen can tell you about what that relationship should be can be huge in getting a bond and working with your financial statements to dress up that bonding at the end of the year. So well, that's thanks. why I'm glad to work with you. Thanks. I strongly believe that your bonding and insurance agent ought to be the same person. For one reason, when you call in for a bid bond, I'm looking at those specs and I'm an extra set of eyes to make sure that you're getting all the insurance those specs uh, require you to have. Do you already have them in place? If not, I'm going to give you a price so you can add it into your bid, but you're not going to be left flat-footed. So reading specs is something a lot I do. Okay, so you, you find a good construction insurance agent. So I say I've already got one. What's the next step? Well, you need to decide whether you're going to shop it. Is your current insurance agent an independent agent, which means they represent many different companies? Or are they an agent that just represents one company? And if that's the case, you may want to get another insurance agent to, to come in and quote it. There's lots of good construction-oriented insurance agents around this country. And you can find someone else to quote it. That's the first thing that you do is you decide, I'm going to shop my insurance. And the key, guys, is don't do it all the time. I recommend no more than every three years. And the reason is, is because there's only limited markets out there and there's only, there is a limit to good construction-oriented agents. And they quote you for free and they're not going to do it more than once. They need a fair chance at quoting your insurance. So you pick another agent. First order of business. Tip number two, make your insurance carriers hungry, starving for your business. So the, the way you do that is you sell yourself, guys. I mean, we all sell ourselves, but why would an insurance company want to write your business? Well, I'm a good contractor and I'm safety conscious and we communicate it. Safety comes from the top down in my organization. 
So the way to make the insurance companies hungry are to put together an RFQ, Request for Qualifications. Most of all of you federal contractors know about those. RFQ means I'm putting a copy of my policies and my five, five years of loss runs. Five years is how far they look back. Loss runs are your losses that come straight from the insurance carrier. And here's the thing, guys, when you put your RFP together and you get the loss runs from your agent, and when you order the loss runs from your agent or your agent's assistant, then your agent's going to know that you're shopping the insurance. That's like number one red flag. So if you're going to do it, tell your agent what you're going to do and set the ground rules. Just say, hey, look, my company's really growing insurance. We think is getting out of control and we're going to shop our insurance this year. I'm going to pick another agent or I've picked another agent and uh, we're going to let you pick the companies that you want. And you get our current carrier automatically. Then they get a pick. And we go on down the line until all the companies have been assigned. So that's one way to make sure that you're getting your RFP out to all the right markets. That is actually a point. I think most people don't know this. Uh-huh. How does this work? Only one agent can quote per company. You can't get like five the, quotes from the same company. Is that how that's that right? That's right. Once you turn in a quote, which is a set of applications and a set of loss runs, then they log you in as the agent of record. And so in order for that to be changed, you as the contractor have to write a letter to the insurance carrier saying, hey, I want so-and-so to be my agent of record with your company. Mm. And that's different than other type of insurance, like life insurance or some some other things. Right, you know, absolutely. Completely, company. completely different. Interesting. That's good to know. I think I made that mistake a few times in my insurance quoting history. Okay. All right. You have put together your basic package. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you go to our link, there's an article that outlines all of this for you. I'm just kind of giving you the big picture. Go to the link, right, Wade? Tell them to go to the link. Down in the show notes. Where is it? Down at the bottom of the page, right? In the show notes at the bottom. Look it up. And rate us, by the way. Okay. Five stars. Or or if you don't. Sorry, Steve. Five stars don't rate us. I didn't say that at the beginning, but okay. (laughs) I think we got off topic. Sorry, Stephen. That's okay. Are we That's number right. three? Is this number three now? This what is number this? three. Make your insurance companies compete. So we talked about finding an agent, making the companies hungry. You make them hungry by putting together a good request for a proposal that uh, lets them know why you're a good risk. And then finally, you, you want the companies to compete. And the best way to do it is companies get quotes all the time from agents that they just may be blocking them as a market. They know they're going to be high or they know they're going to keep it with a certain carrier. Guys, we have 20 different insurance companies to be fed here and they all want a minimum of a million dollars from us. So we're constantly feeding them premium so we can get the best quotes for our customers. But they all come in and they go over their list of applications. They come in the office and say, hey, we got these accounts in here. Which ones can we write? Well, you can write them all if you give us the best price. Well, that's not what they want to hear. Are are we being shopped? Are we being blocked? You want the companies to compete. And the best way to do it is you make sure your agent tells everyone that they're sending it to that I am going, I'm getting this RFP says, here are the coverages that I have to have. And I'm going with the best price. Because... My agent wouldn't even shop it to you if you weren't a good insurance carrier. So there you go. I want the best price because the insurance underwriters got to know that it's going to take price to get this. They know that with new accounts, but at the same time, if you're the incumbent agent, they're like, hey, we really want this account. We can do a little better on this line of business than that. It's kind of a negotiating deal. So make them compete. Next thing is uh, put together a loss control report. All the good insurance carriers have good loss control people. And if you're a big enough account, usually $50,000 or more in premium, they're going to come visit you before the underwriter gives you a quote. 
and they're going to have their checklist of things. So either you meet with them yourself as the owner, or you have them meet with the, the safety manager that you have on site. But either way, make sure they're welcome and make sure you answer all their questions about safety. Now, you don't have to be worried about that. If you've got a good agent, they will help prepare you for that. But we list in the show notes all the things that need to go in that loss control report. And there's a lot of stuff. And you may not have all that stuff, guys. You might not have the, the safety program the way it needs to be. Your agent can help you with that. Again, this is something your agent should do. Wade, it sounds like we got a great agent here that knows what he's talking about. So. Oh, I already know that. I yeah. Already- Thanks. Man, it's getting thick. All right. Another thing. <laughs> this is exciting. That you can do, insurance. Another thing you can do, guys, is if you pay enough in premium, and that's generally $250,000 or more a year in premium for all your coverage, you can start talking to your agent about larger deductibles. Oh, program. Just be number five, then. Are we on number five now? Number five, the larger deductibles or forming a captive. Your insurance agent can tell you all about this. Forming a captive basically means you're starting your own insurance company and you're paying another insurance company to handle your your claims and some reinsurance limits. So as you get bigger, that may be a viable option, but you can always look into larger deductibles. Okay, number six, guys. Number six is minimizing your fleet of vehicles. Guys, auto insurance is the tail that's wagging the dog right now. It's the big kahuna. And it used to be workers' comp was the main chunk of your insurance premium, but now it's auto, guys. And you know that usually all those auto insurance uh, lawyers were on TV during the day, during soap operas. Now they're out at night. They're 24-7 hitting you. They don't stop, do they? No. So you got attacked by one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you got a sign that says so and so construction company, you're a commercial. They know you got commercial insurance, and odds are you carry higher limits. Payday, man. So if you're gonna have a wreck, go hit a commercial vehicle. (laughs) That's my advice. Yep, I've got stories on that. But let's let's well, I'm not it used to be you would have all your personal vehicles, yours, your wife's, your kids' vehicles, all under the commercial auto policy for your business. That way it's a tax deduction. Just throw it all in there. You can't do that anymore, guys. Pick up trucks. I remember, well, I'm showing my age, but I remember a big fleet of Ford F-150s I had insured for $615 a piece, and that was a million dollars liability and a comp and collision deductible of 500 bucks. Now, just liability only on an old Ford F-150 is $1,200 a year. And the newer the vehicle it is, that premium's getting over $2,000 to $2,300 a year. The the price on an average dump truck that I'm seeing that used to be $3,000 a year is now $4,800 a year. Anyway, if you're not using it, don't insure it. And if it's a personal vehicle, even yours, if you can take it and put it with your personal insurance agent, it's going to be a fourth of what you're paying commercially. So I say minimize your fleet. Now's not the time. Now you got vehicles that are commercial. You don't have a choice. That's a different animal. Next one. You ready, guys? We're ready, man. Lucky number seven. Yeah, number seven. Review how all your employees are classified. Insurance premiums for contractors are based on payroll, not sales. And your payroll is rated by classification for general liability and workers' comp. Workers' comp, it's a rate per $100 of payroll. So you got to make them all clerical. Now you're got it. (laughs) You were picking it up. (laughs) You were grabbing hold of everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't do that, Rob. But okay. I tell you what, there's I, I, a lot of, if, if they legitimately paint 90% of the time and 10% of the time they do some carpentry, then technically your auditor can pick it all up under carpentry. But interesting. the best way to handle that is just put them all under painting. When the auditor comes, have a list of everyone in their right classification. Try to be fair and reasonable. They're going to know. 
they're going to look at your sign when they pull up to do your audit and have some idea what you do. <laughs> so anyway, work with your agent on that. Make sure every employee is classified correctly. You know, in the old days, guys, only the state of Tennessee wrote workers' comp policies through the sign risk pool when I was starting off in Memphis as an insurance agent. And now everybody wants workers' comp. So now more than ever, it may be a good time to have your workers' comp outside of your current carrier. Get a separate quote for workers' comp. I do it all the time. Generally, you want to keep all your policies with one carrier because that's more premium. And then when you have some losses, they think, well, this is a $100,000 account. We only had $80,000 in, in losses, so we made 20%. That's You can save a ton of money on workers' comp right now. So definitely shop that. Kind of just echo what you're saying about those workers' comp. We help contractors multiple times a year with workers' comp audits and general liability audits. And, you know, having those people in the right classification, having a system that puts people in the right classification, if they change job for change codes for whatever they're doing, and you've got documentation of that, the auditors will buy it. But if you have no documentation, they're going to put you in the highest risk class. Is that not right? That's exactly right. Your agent should help you get your audit ready before the auditor comes. That's the key. And I do it all the time. Most good agents do. They make sure, at least until whoever's handling the audit is so well-versed to handling that they don't need you anymore, which is a good feeling. Next thing, beside classifying people properly, is read your policy after oh, you get it. God, that doesn't sound fun. No, but it is fun. It's fun. No, no. It's no. Just Empire. scan. Look, scan through it, and every place you see a dollar sign with the number, that means there was a charge for it. <laughs> well, it's not quite as exciting as tax law, but it's <laughs> right on up there. So. <laughs> now you're talking. There might be three or four percent of your premium tied in there in small coverages that were just thrown in that were charged for that you don't need. Uh, do that. And along with talking about the policy, I recommend people move your effective date to the end of the second quarter of the year. A lot of people have December 31st year end and they have December 31st insurance renewal effective dates. It may be easier that way. Who cares? But to save money at the end of the second quarter, all the insurance companies are really hungry to hit their numbers for that year. That's when it's just starting to get real. End of May or June, I have a lot of effective dates there. It's just a good time for marketing insurance. I didn't know that. Yeah. Number, Number nine, you've got your RFP, you got your loss control done, and you got a set a drop dead date with your agent or agents as to when you want your quote. And you can say, I want this quote two months before renewal. That ain't going to happen. Even one month before renewal, that ain't going to happen. It doesn't matter. Your insurance carriers are playing the same game. The last one in with the number was wins. Because that way, if you're the last in, you can always kind of feel out your contractor to see how your numbers are looking. Mm-hmm. Always. So have a drop dead date of one week before the renewal date. That's it, guys. And then if someone comes straggling in the day of the renewal or the day after with a good quote, it's too late. You got to kind of live and die by that or they won't take you seriously. So that's my advice on that. Interesting. So so the other thing to read between the lines on that is they, they have some flexibility bidding against each other. So it's not just a calculation. They fill it in and it comes out of a spreadsheet. They just boom, and then this. You want to make sure they're coming in with their best numbers. Got it. We call it in the industry generally the FY look which is what you give your incumbent agent when the other agent's coming in trying to write the business. It's like, hey, man, hey, you've done a good job for me. Hey, this is where you need to be. Just get it there because I like working with you. You're a good guy. Hey, hey, that's not how the game's played. That's how you might want to play it, but you won't be able to shop every three or four years if you uh, play it that way. Just got to be fair about it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Are we ready for number 10? Number 10, number 10. God, the way the suspense is killing me. How about you, man? Wait, he can barely talk. He can't even talk. 
Hey, guys, the last thing to remember is it's a process, all right? Don't be a heavy hand in this process. Give everybody what they need. Make sure they meet everyone. Make sure they know that you're glad they came by to quote your insurance. And you'd be amazed at what they will do for you. Just simply being respected and appreciated for what they do. Because remember, insurance agents can work on two bases. A lot of them work on a commission basis, and some of them work on a fee basis, where they just charge you a flat fee to handle your insurance uh, policies. But either way, odds are, if your agent's working on a commission basis, if they don't get your business, they don't get anything. And you say, well, that's fine. That's the way I am. I throw up bids all the time and I don't get them. Okay, well, think of it that way. How would you want to be treated in a fair world? Just looking at the lower numbers is not the answer. But in this situation, if you put together absolutely everything you require and you check your quote and you make sure those items are there and you get the lowest price, you're going to be amazed how much money you save. That's great. That is great. Okay. Those were our top 10. Is that right? Wade, was that 10? You're the count. That's 10. Yep. Good. <laughs> that was officially 10. All right. Hey, is it always right. the low bid, though, that you take? No, I mean, <clears throat> you need to make sure in the request for qualifications what you require in service. Uh, here at McDaniel Whitley, we're proud of the fact that we're rated as one of the best practices agency, the top 5% of the agencies in the country on how we run our business. When you call, you're going to get a person to talk to. And there's always anyone here can handle any problem you have if the person you need to talk to is out. And we're getting insurance certificates for you quickly. We're turning in claims and then we're following up on those claims. Because if you just turn in a claim and let them drift into outer space, then those numbers get higher and higher. And then when your agent sits down with you with your loss runs or sends me, you say, whoa, 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 how did this claim get so big? Well, I told you that this was not our fault. Did you communicate that to the claims adjuster? Well, you know, it was their decision. Okay, so a good agent is involved with claims because all you're buying is a piece of paper till you have a claim. So, all right. All right. I, I hope everybody's listening to this by the fire pit and their campfire. So this is great campfire talk. So Just feeding that fire with their policies. Yeah. All right. Wade, you got any parting words? Yeah. I mean, the parting words, are, yeah, absolutely. The relationship you have with your agent can definitely make a huge difference in your business. The ability to get bonds to building a healthy company. I can't tout enough that, you know, when you have a great relationship, with the CPA and all that, you definitely can make a big difference in your business. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Wade and Stephen. Great discussion. Our great campfire talk about insurance tips for contractors. We are the Contractor Success Forum, bringing enlightened clarity to your contracting business. So thank you for listening today. Give us a rating of five stars down there. Five. See, Stephen's holding up his hand for five. I know you can't see it if you're listening to a podcast, but you ten. can also watch us. Oh, wait, once ten or five twice. Can you rate twice? I don't know. But we ten. are the contractor success for him. Thank you for listening to us and have a wonderful day thinking about your future. See y'all.